Hello again, it's David Woolley, the curator from the Tank Museum, doing another question and answer session. Um, as you can see, even though the Tank Museum's open, I'm doing this from home. This is, I believe, about our 24th question and answer session. And uh, to, I was forewarning you, um, this will be probably our last one in this particular way of doing it in our format. And I can tell you, those of you who enjoy these question and answers, keep watching to the end because I'll be showing how you can look at future question and answers and also see lots of other ones we've done in the past as well by joining our Patreon scheme for an amazingly good offer. Um, so hang on in there if you're interested in that type of stuff. And those of you, again, who've been watching these regularly, you know the idea is I'm trying to answer some of the questions people have put to us, whether it's in the comments or they've emailed something in. I'm trying to sell you some of the uh, products we're selling in our online shop because that's a really important source of income for us at the moment. And I say every time, thank you so much for those of you who have um, been buying things. That's a real asset to us. It's been really helpful over these, uh, you know, these COVID times. And I'm here with Finn the Mutt, um, who's my dog, who just went and sprained his leg just a little bit earlier. So I'm not sure he seems... He seems keen to chase the ball, but I don't know if he's going to give up on that in a minute or two, but he'll help a little bit later on explaining some of the things we need to discuss. Um, so let's get on with some of the questions. Um, Paul Beckworth, he uh, emailed in and he said, some years ago I visited the Tank Museum and I remember seeing you had a turret from the Panther II on display. The information board said it was found on one of the army ranges um, and had been... You do want the ball, don't you? All right, go on then. There you go. Forgive uh, the, the dogs there all the time. Uh, anyway, and he said um, it, uh, it had been found on one of the army firing ranges, it's been identified, moved to the museum. And, and uh, where is it, as it were, and is it somewhere safe? Yes, I think it's back on display. We have it on a trolley, actually, and I think we've moved it around near where the panther is. Um, but those of you who don't know the story, it's basically they were already designing a replacement for the panther, but that got canned fairly early on in May of 1943. And uh, what ends up happening is they, as part of that design process, they get Rheinmetall is looking at um, the evidence from when they've been meeting Russian tanks on the Eastern Front, narrower frontages, why make their tank frontages so wide, it's more of a target to aim at. So they were looking at designing a new turret with a narrower front, simpler to make, good protection at the front, thinner at the sides, um, to still carry the same gun that the Panther was going to be carrying. And they were going to call that the Schmal term or small turret. And uh, that development slows down after the Panther II project is sort of knocked on the head, but they then revive it. Rheinmetall take too long, they pass it over to Daimler-Benz and that, uh, a couple of prototypes are made, they even fit one as a trial on what's going to become the Panther F. It doesn't go into production though, um, but it's, you know, obviously in this sort of paper panzers as they're sometimes called, everyone's interested in what might have been coming next, what are the development issues. Now two of those turrets remain uh, or did re remained and were picked up at the end of the war. One was taken back for the Americans, one was taken back to Britain for analysis. And like a lot of this kit, when it came to the end of its useful life, like a lot of captured tanks, some of them had been used, some of them originally for firing trials, um, they end up on the ranges uh, to be shot at further as hard targets. Um, some things interesting, certain items are saved, hence our collection at the Tank Museum. Other stuff gets put at the back of the shed. You know, our level of interest in it is diminishing after we think we've learned something from it. Some of it's scrapped pretty much very straight away. That Schmel term was used as a hard target on a range and then identified and then brought down and handed over to the museum collection. Um, you know, it suffered a loss. It's, 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 it's bowed, it's, you know, the barrel sliced off, um, but it's still a remaining, you know, pretty much the only one now I think that's left of, uh, of those prototypes for the uh, Schmal term. But yes, it's there in the uh, museum. And I was interested, I was just looking this up because that turret, part of the design features, and again, going back to this German, where do they over-engineer? Part of the design criteria there, they were aiming to make that turret with, uh, in about uh, two thirds of the time they were making the Panther turret, as well as thickening the front, eliminating a shot trap, etc., and all those other things that we know about. Um, 
And they even speculated putting that Schmalturm turret on the Panzer IV at one point as well, which again, if you imagine those two going together, it's an interesting combination there. Um, right, anything else? Next question, here we go. Um, how did the Tank Museum become involved with Haynes? Um, the very first Haynes publishes, I think they're under the same title in America and some other countries, they used to publish do-it-yourself car repair manuals, but obviously at the time now we're getting into black box technology, um, you know, some manufacturers are not even wanting an owner to change their oil themselves. It wants it will go back to the garage for the proper service and everything. Um, Haynes had picked up on that and people just generally weren't fixing their own cars. So they needed to find new markets. But their format was well known and their markets around the world, you know, they got great distribution. So one of the issues we had was they'd started off by doing a kind of manual on the Spitfire and that had gone very well. And um, very early on their... Uh, um, the guy in charge of the military section, Jonathan Faulkner, came down and had a chat with us and we had a sort of, you know, looked at the format, looked at the idea. And the obvious one, pretty much, and we'll do this with anything really, is if you can put your toe in the water, if it works with Tiger, you know you're getting somewhere, or that's your best offer, as it were. There's no point doing it if, if we go too obscure and then no one buys anything. So um, myself, David Fletcher, Mike Hayton, a uh, number of the volunteers, Mike Gibb, who looks after the uh, Wheeled Foundation, he did a little bit on uh, making Zimmerit. So we, we did that first Haynes manual, and that was the first one that was done on tanks, and I believe it's still their bestseller. I, every now and again, I get a message, or I talk to Jonathan, the um, editor chap, and he sort of tells us how many they've done in terms of world sales. And if you're still interested, if you haven't got one, I'd recommend get it, because they've got them in those slightly smaller format, all the same amount of information in that icon series, they're calling them, uh, and that with the uh, Churcher one is dirt cheap on our website, so follow the link uh, to our website. Um, and then from there it's grown, but not all of the military ones, obviously, they're not all to do with the tank museum. Some we've helped write, some we've almost, like it were, sponsored. We've found the author, we've got all the photographs or something. Others have been done entirely independently. And again, if, if you like the format, because they're very popular, um, I have to say, we've just got some other ones, new ones in uh, US spy satellites. So you Russian uh, GRU or KGB guys who, you know, you might want to pick up a copy of that. Blackburn Buccaneer, we've got aeroplane ones in stock as well. And um, what are we, astute cast submarines as well. So, you know, the range has gone out there, but what they've tried to do is almost keep that look and format initially of how they used to do plenty of illustrations, good line drawings and the cover. Um, but, you know, 20 years ago, if anyone said a Haynes manual, it was all about, you know, you bought it and there you were with greasy fingers at the weekend trying to repair your car or work out how you got your light bulb or tightened up, you know, bits and pieces on the vehicles. But anyway, that's how we got involved with Haynes. Uh, and there's other titles coming up. So look out. We're about to any moment have our Matilda 2 and that's got all the restoration story in. So there will be, that'll be our coming out sometime. I'm not too sure, so, you know, we've just done the proofs and everything. So sometime soon that'll be coming out. Um, John Tasker says, um, oh, hang on, Michael Haven, just talking about tigers. There were some large size brackets on the right side of some tigers, U-shaped, what were they for? Now I'm assuming you mean U-shapes on the side of the turret. If that's what you're talking about, that's where they, used to hang um, spare track links and they were purposely put on for that. There was all sorts of you know, field mods that people put some across the front. What do you know about it? You don't know anything. Go and find the ball, go on. Um, and, uh, but the ones on, especially on the King Tigers, you'll see a couple of these loops and there's brackets on Tiger, later model Tiger ones, where they would actually have them vertically and they'd be in almost like a bracket holding over the top and at the base. Um, but those U-shaped ones, if that's what I think you're talking about, they were putting, hanging a whole link on. They tended to be on the side of King Tigers. Um, John Tasker. Two questions. If money was no object, which tank would the museum overhaul and get running next? Um, in the same way as we've done with the Matilda and the Churchill. Um, and one for me being completely self-indulgent, what would I personally like to see given the works? Well, we, we know, and I think I've mentioned this before, we like having a big heavy German tank to run. You know, there's certain sort of areas that you really want to cover off if we're going to run German or start at the beginning. 
We'd love something from the 30s. World War I, we've said, we've retired them, hence a replica Mark IV we have. World War II, it's great to be able to parade certain key classic Second World War tanks, you know, look at this, it would go against that, design criteria, etc. Bring it here then, come on. Um, and what, what, what's going to be an issue for us, and this is something I think I've mentioned before, we've been sort of looking at and workshops and header collections looking at, is the idea what's a sustainable running fleet for the future, what's worth laying down, what are the things we might run, be able to run once in a blue moon, and uh, what are we kidding ourselves, don't even go there type stuff. So that's tricky as a question because there's some things obviously in the background we've got ideas about, we might try and fundraise for and, and do other ways of trying to do these things. It could be as well, there's, there'll, there'll have to be other ways of doing things in the future, you know, and a lot of you have been asking about 3D printing, replicas, when is, you know, one thing we do with Tank Fest now is we try and invite in other tanks as well. The idea we've got to run our tank is just a bit, you know, we just can't do that, we haven't got the resources. So if someone else has got that tank that we can actually show at Tank Fest, that's another way we're trying to go for the future and sort of, um, you know, think we've got to think longer term as well as a, as a museum because, you know, we, as I've said before, we've run a lot of vehicles in the past and it did what we wanted it to do. It's put us on the map. It's got people coming in. They now know about us. That's what they now know about Tank Fest and going to the museum and seeing the runners, how we're going to do that sustainably because any one of you, and it'll come up as a question in a moment, if you've got a vehicle of your own, you'll know it's very problematic trying to keep a historic vehicle going in the longer term. Great for one summer, couple of, you know, outings, but is it really going to be in the same state two, three, four, five years in the future? And that's one of our problems, thinking long term. So um, we've got a number of projects on the go. One of the issues we're trying to face up to as well at the moment is finishing off older projects that sometimes got started and for all sorts of reasons, sometimes some of them very, very, you know, understandable, they got stopped. Um, so let's make sure we get some of those finished off. Um, you know, for myself, I love the idea of some of the British stuff, but I would also say I would rather we actually got some of the collection in better order, better presented. So, for example, let's finish some of them off, let's stow some of them, let's make them look a, you know, there's a lot of erroneous paint schemes in there, let's get some of that. I would much rather we spent a lot more effort on that in terms of, because doing a major restoration sucks in so much time, money and energy, and other things can, if you're not careful, get ignored. Or, as, you know, myself and other members of staff, you know, these were something we were going to do, and you suddenly realise, well, actually, that was five or ten years ago, and we still haven't done it yet. So... Uh, it's a tricky one there um, about seeing that and, and again we've got so many wonderful um, you know quirky British vehicles wouldn't it be great to, take to see a Cavalier to see a Centaur um, you know to see some of that Cromwell family just even a static Challenger A30 you know we got the bits as it were let's see those put back together even as a static not necessarily a runner you know which takes a huge amount more time energy and issues um, and then we've got that you know, British tank story, which don't forget with the British Tank Museum, we should be really doing. Um, right. Um, I hope that sort of answered that one. Um, let's have a go. What was the purpose? Here we go. This is from JBRI Live out in France. What was the purpose of the Berg Tiger that was found abandoned on the roadside in Lisley in June of 44? Um, how did it come to be? Now this is an interesting one because again, if you look in some of the early Tiger books, this all stems to a British intelligence report that they come across a Tiger, and if you can find the photographs, if you've got a book on a Tiger, they're often in there, or it's probably on, you, on the internet somewhere on Google Images. Um, basically it's a Tiger, and where the gun, the 88mm gun, there's a plate over it, and there seems to be a boom that's been welded and bolted onto the top of the turret. So was this a recovery tank? And that was the speculation that intelligence, when they get a photograph of it, put, and that's in the file at the tank museum, and that starts that idea that there's a recovery version of the Henshaw production Tiger One. It's not done for that. This is the unit, Schwer Panzer Abt Island 508, they're fighting in Italy as early as April. They're reporting back to Germany that doing experiments 
trying to work out how to deal with mines. And again, you know, we always go for the glamour of the tank battles. Actually, if you read accounts all the time, it's mines so often are the bane of tank crews' lives because it means they've got to stop, they're not that able to support, there's a huge amount of work they then have to physically engage with, having to repair a track if the mine's gone off, you know, uh, and disabled um, or bent the track or done something that way. Sorry, let's get the dog sorted. Um, and um, what this unit, actually in the 508th in Italy, what they've done is they've done a improvisation on a Tiger I. They've taken out the 88 millimeter gun and this boom was actually, there's a winch and the idea was it was supposed to be able to go forward and help lay charges ahead of the main tank. So where they knew there was mines or a minefield, this was part of something they were experimenting with to actually lay mines out, uh, lay charges out the front so they could then detonate remotely and uh, end up clearing a path through a minefield. That was what that particular tank was. So it was never meant as a recovery tank at all. And that stemmed, and it's like a lot of these sort of stories, myths, it'll die down a bit or it's been corrected in certain volumes and then all of a sudden someone will find the photograph and say oh look a recovery tiger again you know and it starts it all over again so that's that story behind that one particular tiger that was photographed and got the rumor going that there was actually a recovery tank so um, i hope that answers that um, alan stott asked the question why travel locks on guns on tanks and uh, this is one that you've kind of almost, Alan, I sort of saw, you know, you've kind of answered it yourself. Yes, it's, it's about securing the gun. And quite often, um, when you think about it, the weight of a gun on those pivoting arms or uh, lugs that it's actually sort of resting on, that's quite a bit of weight on that. And the idea of that metal being able to move freely when, especially in a tank, it might be going by rail, it might be traveling by road, it's going all over the place. So one of the things they were looking at is, first of all, secure the turret. So quite often turrets inside have what they call a turret lock. It's a way of stopping that turret rolling or, or turning around on the, whatever the system is, whether it's a ball bearing race or whatever, that's holding the turret. Um, because again, you can imagine that if there's a train going along and this, this turret starting to vibrate and start to turn that barrel the next minute, it's clipping a train coming the other way or something rather. So it's, it's, and the same as driving along the road as well, this idea of the crew that you get mesmerized inside a vehicle, you're not always sure what direction you're facing in the turret, etc. So there's a safety issue there, a really big one. There's also the idea of if the gun is allowed to wobble, it actually wears on the trunnions and you can start getting wear and the gun goes out of alignment and that's why you're always zeroing guns all the time. In other words, making sure your scope and the main gun is in alignment and everything's secure. So there's that, that issue going on. Again, so if you're locking the gun down in some way, you're, you're lessening the chance of that happening. And when tank barrels, and the real issue here is why we have the locks on the outside, tank barrels are getting longer and therefore there's more chance of them flexing, more chance of them doing a lot of damage if they get loose, etc. And you need to, because they're getting heavier as well, you need to support them. Otherwise, all the weight's going on those two little trunnions either side of uh, where the barrel's located into its main housing. So that they start, that's why you start seeing them. Um, and quite often, early on, you see some of the, uh, the Shermans on the front fireflies sometimes on a back corner so that again this is really a travel lock uh, in terms of just a general gun lock and a lot of tanks inside as well like the tiger it has hooks on the end of the breech which actually hook over a mounting that hold comes down from the roof and uh, again that stops the idea as well of too much vibration causing damage big heavy gun of course and there's other things as well that you know again you're trying to do it so there's no chance of that barrel flexing bending or doing any damage and uh, you'll see those travel locks really it's the second world war onwards as guns are getting longer modern guns you know you've just got such a big overhang so if you're putting it back over the engine deck you want to secure it in pace because again that idea of that turret lock you'll double do, you know two different ways of doing safety because if that turret lock was to come loose and there's something you know the length of a chieftain barrel imagine that just on the back of a tank transporter spinning or um on a train or something else like that you know the damage the weight it is so where you can support it you do that's why you've got to travel lot um thanks to um uh, is it laney mon anyway getting in touch back right here. come here come in bring it here good boy 
Um, yeah, Laney Mon says about getting in touch with Mr. Kono Tara, who I believe is the, uh, you're telling me he's a Japanese defence minister, so we might be asking for a Type 74, so thank you very much for that as a kind of like point of contact, and we're trying some routes to make sure that when we do write a letter request, it really gets on the right person's desk, as you can imagine, you know, if you're approaching a government anywhere, the chance of it getting on an in-tray or not even getting to the person who might actually think, well, hang on a second, there's an issue here and it's worth looking at. So thank you for sending that one in. Um, Vargas asks what happens with a tank gun. In other words, when it's barrel life, it sort of is, is, is the way it's when it wears out. Um, barrel life is normally the term used when you're firing guns. There's the physical um, wear of the round going down, if it's rifled down the rifling, wearing it down. You've got the chemical effect, the heat and the chemicals from the explosion, which again kind of wears out the barrel, actually it corrodes on the metal, which is why again you need to clean tank guns as well to get rid of those very corrosive chemicals. Um, basically you're eating away at that metal barrel every time you fire the gun. And what they try and do is work out what is a sensible barrel life before that barrel needs replacing. And the example I've got is the L56 on the Tiger 1. They were reckoned they were good for 6,000 rounds, but that depends on what type of round you're doing. Because if you've got a higher charge, you've got more chance of wear and tear. Different types of rounds, of course, have different, uh, um, you, you, you know, sort of physical properties so they're going to sort of um, do things at a different rate um, and uh, some modern guns got down to very low you know numbers in the couple of hundreds um, before they were due to be either re-chromed replaced or other things happened to them um, so barrel life what tends to happen the old days it was the gunner would see a failure in accuracy however well you're zeroing um, you know, the round is not being as accurate onto a, a known point target, so you're getting barrel wear. You can compensate to a certain degree with barrel wear, but not always. Um, so then it might be that it gets to the point of being replaced as a gun. Many tanks, of course, never get to that point in their service life, as in, they, 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 you know, there's another reason. Either the tank's knocked out or it's replaced or it's broken down or other things before it comes to the end of that gun's barrel life. But most tanks for longer term production runs like a Centurion, Chieftain, etc., they were given a, a, a system that a tank barrel can be replaced once they know it's starting to wear out that way. And um, some of them actually, they go if, you know, like in training ones, they can go back to the kind of, you know, the workshop as it were, where they can actually measure, measure the barrel wear in technical ways. Um, so they've got a definite, this is okay, this is safe. And, and modern tanks as well, it tends to be recorded. So there is a, a record of how many rounds each tank barrel has fired so that you know it's coming to the end of its working life, etc. even if you can't see it in terms of accuracy. Um, so I hope that kind of answers that one for you. Idra Ida Bagus says, fluff up Finn for me. I did a little bit earlier, um, admiring Finn's tail, but uh, which I'm, I'm a bit naughty actually, I don't brush him enough at this time of year. He's lying around out the front, picking up leaves and everything all the time. And uh, of course, all he does is and he walks it in the house, shakes, and I've got dead leaves and bits of grass and you name it all over the place. But uh, he's sitting there in the sunshine at the moment. Actually, it started off really nippy this morning when we went for a walk and everything. And now the sun's coming up and it's getting quite warm. Um, Frise Tron says, what tanks and armoured cars would be a practical for a civilian to own? Which are the easiest to maintain and keep road legal? Um, I always think this is one of those uh, questions that, that it's illogical. There is no vehicle, armoured vehicle, that's easy to keep and maintain and keep running. So, you know, from that point of view, because um, I always remember someone sort of saying about, you know, scratching his chin, saying, you know, what's the, uh, what MPG per gallon, as if that was going to be a deciding factor when you were buying a tank. You know, you are just throwing fuel into it just to start the engine so when you're talking about miles per gallon and everything you know it's a wrong you're in the wrong game just the wrong questions to ask um, but people do own military vehicles they own tanks they own armored vehicles etc armored cars wheeled ones um, so what are the things to think have you got somewhere if it's a track vehicle that you can drive it if you can't legally drive it on the road. In other words, you don't have a H license, as it's called, for a track vehicle driver. Um, if you want to be able to drive safely, um, again, uh, another consideration is most track vehicles, you will need a commander 
and a driver. So you'll always need two of you to be able to drive it safely because the commander's basically in control of the vehicle because he's looking around and he's telling the driver. So you do have an effective comms kit because again, you will get prosecuted if you can't prove that you're safe on the road. Um, so the idea that, you know, I couldn't see Gov is not an answer if you've taken, decided to take out your tank on, on your own as a driver. Um, so things like where are you going to drive it? Have you got access to land? If it's a track vehicle, if it's road legal in the sense of a wheeled vehicle, um, is it safe to drive? I used to get my M, uh, Dingo MOT regularly because I just wanted to feel someone's had a look at it. Um, so they could suddenly say, by the way, did you not see this? You know, and there's a crack in something or other. Um, so you're again, you've got to have insurance. Um, and again, remarkably, some of that insurance is relatively cheap. But just make sure it's the right insurance for what you're doing. Read the small print. Are you just on for public roads? Is it third party? You know, what do I really need to um, insure there? And um, where are you going to put it is the other classic. So some small wheeled armoured vehicles, why ferrets, I think, and it was originally in many ways, Jeeps were so popular, Jeeps, because you could fit in the garage. Um, you know, it was something that seemed practical, uh, even on a cold day, you know, an open top Jeep, you know, you're driving around in an open top vehicle. Um, but something like a ferret was small enough, it seemed, to get in the garage. Otherwise, if it's going to stay outside, it's going to suffer. And uh, if you need commercial storage, then that's going to add to the cost all the time, you know, and, or find a friend, you know, that's going to keep it for you. So there's a whole host of issues like that that's probably worth thinking through. But I would certainly say, you know, there's another one, which is some of those older vehicles. Um, genuinely, there's not an awful lot sometimes to go wrong with them, but can you replace the tyres? Is there another, you know, way of doing some of the things there if things go wrong and you can't get original spare parts? Um, the idea that there's certain vehicles with lots of spare parts out there, I hate to say we've gone past that Cold War dividend, everything's disappeared. Um, there are spare parts, obviously, you know, here and there, but they get more and more expensive. But in certain types of vehicles, people have started replacing them. And that's been going on for yonks with Jeeps. You can pretty much get everything, um, you know, remanufactured to do with a Jeep, for example. Ferrets, some people have started doing things like exhausts, certain things that they know people have now run out of finding original sources or supplies of. So those would be the types of things I'd say there. And therefore in Britain, you know, the ferret, my dingoes, you know, lovely examples of things that do go in a garage. Uh, you can drive an open top ferret, Mark early Mark one, etc. You can drive on your own. A turreted one, you need a commander with you. My dingo, because I can see all around and I, I can drive that on my own, but anything enclosed or the driver's limited visibility, you need a second person and think about that if, you know, how are you going to use this vehicle and how often, you know, and people often say things like, oh, you know, when I'll be able to make some money from film jobs. You might, but that's a rarity. So don't think there's an income source there. Oh, I'm going to do weddings and everything. Well, good luck to you, you know, if you think, um, there's going to be enough people want to have your slightly oily vehicle turning up just outside the church at the right time. You know, you might get it once in a while, but none of those things are going to compensate for the real costs of running that vehicle. What I would say, though, is once you've weighed up and done all those things and the list of why you shouldn't do it is enormous. Actually, what's the reason you want to do it? And you look at those and sometimes, you know, your heart overrules your head sometimes and for very good reasons, because it might be that sense I want ownership, I want to res you know, show respect, grandfather served in this unit, I just want to do it up as if it was um, a vehicle that might have been here at his time or something. So all those other issues come into play. So I won't say that it's a logical set of things, but I would go in with your eyes open so you don't kid yourself that um, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's going to be easy or something or other. As long as you can face up to all those potential problems and still want to do it, then I'd say go ahead because for me, the private ownership of military vehicles, certainly in the UK, means that a huge part of our military heritage is being looked after by the enthusiast. And I always say this, what's in a military museum? We're lucky at the Tank Museum, you know, we've got a fairly substantial collection. But uh, what's in a military museum is only the tip of the iceberg compared to what's out there. And military museums can't look after that much. So it's brilliant when we have an enthusiast market, you know, out there doing that, um, keeping the heritage going, turning up at poppy appeals, doing all those events and everything, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, for me, the real problem is how to encourage another generation to do that when either vehicles are getting too rare or too expensive, or even worse, there's decisions to scrap them rather than let them go into the civilian market. Um, so anyway, there we go, that's that one there. Um, 
Gary Hewitt asked the question, why this guy all of the time? Um, I put that to other members of staff if they wanted to do some filming and they all say they just don't like you, Gary Hewitt, so uh, you're going to be stuck with me. But, well, not for much longer unless you want to go and go over to Patreon. Um, Torpen International says, um, you've still got your tie on in your own backyard. I'm working uh, Torpin, so I just consider this is my work dress, so I, uh, I think it's respectful as well, etc. But I am actually at work, even if I am in my own backyard. And if it's just that you want me to open a couple of top buttons and see a bit of chest hairs, we're not that sort of program. I'm afraid, Torpin, you've got the wrong sort of uh, end of the stick there. Um, so another question I got was from Alex Sung, which was an interesting one, because when we were talking about things like um, watches, and this is an issue that sometimes comes up as well with dials in older vehicles, the idea of radium and later tritium being radioactive, what are the issues there? Now the real problem, some of you have heard all these stories before, but, but the idea was from about the uh, turn of the century, they realised with uh, radioactive material into a paint, made the paint glow, and it was radium they were using, and uh, what they'd end up doing, it's radium-226, they would use that and paint on dials and watches and compasses so that the, the, the dial numbers would glow with that radium and uh, be able to be seen in the dark or low light conditions. It was found that the, many of the young ladies who were doing all the painting of this paint off, you did this with your, the end of the brush, painted, got the actual radium paint on, painted it on the right thing, and they ended up with something called fossy jaw, which was basically they were getting cancer of the mouth from the radiation they were picking up from the paint. And later, this led to radium being stopped. They went on to tritium. Tritium had got much less radiation in. The problem we've got is that um, radium, even though the paint doesn't glow anymore, the radioactive material is still in there. Now, for us as a museum, we have to have a radiation license, we have a radiation store, and we have procedures with material, we have a Geiger counter, all the usual sorts of things that in that sort of sphere. The interesting thing is, is outside of the museum, many of you watching this, some of you will have an old compass. If you've got a Geiger counter and went, tick, 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 you know, it goes over the top there. Um, so there's a lot in private ownership that is not looked at in the same way because basically it's just such a big problem no one can face dealing with it in a sense so what you can own privately what you can buy privately so like an old um, like an old compass an old type of watch etc now the issue is in the common sense bit i would say to you is most of that stuff is fairly safe the tritium is especially if it's still secured in its casing etc where you have to really watch it is if that glass breaks or there's a dial on one of those old vehicles, if that glass gets smashed and that paint comes off at all, that's where, again, it's masking up, it's brushing it all into a sealed container. We tend to put them into a tin or something or other, and that is then put in a secure radiation store. What you don't want is any chance of you inhaling it, ingesting it, or it going into a cut on your finger because you are taking that radioactive material into your body that way. So just have a little think about that. So, so most of it is pretty safe if it's you know, kept in a sensible place. The irony I always found as well was, of course, a compass. Where do we put a compass? In our pocket, right next to it, if you're a bloke, next to your crown jewels and everything, and there it is pumping out radiation next to, you know, your DNA sort of source. So, um, so it's, it's, it's kind of one of those issues where, go on a website if you've got any doubts, but the key one is to remember is if you, it's a bit like the old mercury thermometers, if you happen to break one and everything, that's the time you really need to be thinking about it. And that's why sometimes where people say, oh, I want to go in that vehicle, and we have to say to them, look, it's got a whole load of broken dials. Lots of that dials has probably gone in the gunk of old oil and muck that's across the floor until we can actually clean that out safely. A bit like asbestos and other things that way, you really don't want to give yourself the chance of ingesting it or getting it into your system anyway, or being present with it for extended periods of time. And that's where, again, that other idea that radium and tritium can uh, be a problem. But, um, you know, in a watch like this, uh, of this sort of generation, the amounts there and everything else that way, they've stopped really, really using, using that. Tritium was used for a bit longer, but most, at the end of World War II, most of these things were starting to be known about and stopped being used in that way. But watch it, because there's still a fair bit of stuff out there that does it, um, that has it on. So, um, 
I think that's me answering most of those questions. So um, I, as ever, have some things to show you here. Um, things, what was it I was asked to show as well. So I've shown you my these some of these latest Haynes managers. The other ones we've just got in, if you're a jigsaw person, we've just been doing a series of thousand piece jigsaws. Um, so different bits of the museum. Um, so you can get those ones there. They're all now online on our online shop. Follow the link to the online shop. That's where you'll see all these different products. And I've mentioned it before. Sometimes, thank you, dog. Sometimes um, the products go out of stock, but we are restocking and obviously we're adding to it all the time. So it's worth going back. If there was something you were after, and I know one or two of you were looking at things like the 88 millimeter shell case and everything, you know, the inflatable one there, that's the uh, 17 pound one. Go back and have a look because we, once we've got them back in, they'll come up again. Um, winter's coming on. So for your hip flask, we have Tank Museum liqueur. That one's a ginger whiskey of all things. This one's a um, black currant liqueur. So when you're looking for something to put in the hip flask or uh, the present for the uh, person who wants a hip flask, tea, we've got our tins of tea as ever. Um, Victory in Europe, of course this year, sadly, most of the commemorations were very low key because of um, COVID, etc. but you can still have your mug and um, carry that around with you all the time. Um, some of the books as well, we've got a number of those battle story books, again, just good intros um, into a number of those key battles. So, you know, they're, they're I won't say simple reads, they're, they're good little reads, but they'll give you a background if you haven't got the time to read the great big thick one sort of stuff. That one's I mentioned before, Kelly's War, um, a chap who was um, Olympic rower um, who goes off and fights. And again, it's another one of those journals where you just sort of get in the mindset of an Edwardian gent and suddenly being exposed to a new life of the men he comes into contact with, um, the different classes and fighting a proper war. You know, it's a great read. Um, so I'd recommend that one. Um, other things um, you might just want to, we've got stickers and somebody was asking that. So we have the car windscreen ones, but also ones if you've got a motorbike or something, so it's actual stick on sticker. Tank Museum ones there. My other car is the Tiger Tank. Um, Cloth arm badges, do people still put those on to the, you know, the old, um, when you had your wind cheater and you were supposed to sew all the places you'd been or a bit like a scout or something other? Nice leather bookmark. Or is it leather? I don't think it's leather actually, I'm lying. I can't even read it, it says so, so small on the back there. But anyway, but there's your tank bookmark. Um, I've mentioned these countless times before, but if you haven't got them or you've got Christmas coming up, $6.99, absolutely brilliant price for the lovely glossy tank book um, by Dorland Kindersley and there's also for I think it's a fiver it's our souvenir guidebook which is just again another one if you haven't actually had a chance to have a look at it do so or pop it in there if you're making an order or something you've got the money to be able to do it um, that for a fiver it's a great one of the story of the tank using our collections as well that way some of the models we were looking at there this was a lot as well A to Z build and play and the model chap in our shop said these are great value um, £4.99, 172nd scale, and uh, I saw there's smaller ones in here as well. What's that? 172nd as well. You've got other ones here. Um, what's that one? That's a Yag Tiger. So there's different types of models on there as well. And again, thank you for those who've been saying they've been impressed by the model is um, our bag. And behind me, sorry, I've nearly forgotten. Um, hanging up there's a couple of rugby shirts. You can get one with Chieftain on, Tiger on, whatever you fancy, a Challenger tank. And I've got to show, get it up to show you this one. Go on, go fetch it. Oh, it's oh, I hope it's going to focus in about the right place. Um, here we go. This is our flick book with a First World War tank coming towards you. If that was a, a complete blur and you didn't see a thing, I apologise, but otherwise that was that one there. Um, and perhaps um, one of the most important things I was supposed to be telling you is how do you carry on watching our question and answers. Um, now below there is going to be a link uh, which will take you to our Patreon website and you can see there's different grades you know we do it militarily I think it is we've got trooper, sergeant, colonel and there's a list of different things depending on how much. What we're going to do though is because every we know these question and answers have been popular we know not everyone's got too much money at the moment as well so we're doing a special offer. There's a bit there where it says customize your account or custom account if you put in there, you can 
become a patron for as low as a euro, a pound or a dollar. And we're doing that as an offer, as it were, till about January. So you'll still have access to what we'll probably go to is once a month doing these question and answer sort of sessions. Part of that offer as well is 15% off in our shop for any order over 25 quid. So that's a really good offer when you think about it, if, you, if you're thinking of joining up. But that money has helped us pay for an apprentice in the workshop. It's helped us pay for one of the film assistants who's done an apprenticeship with us, Chloe, who does a lot of the editing of some of the things you're seeing here. Um, so it's been a really important and a good source of money for us. And that's why, obviously, we'd be encouraging you to go across there. We'll still be doing our tank chats, which are free, which will be coming out you know, pretty much once a week. Uh, we'll still have other content coming out. And we've got plenty of other things coming up as well, which you need to you know, keep looking on the website, keep going on to our, whether it's Facebook or the YouTube bit, because there'll be things coming out that way as well. So I've mentioned earlier, we're gonna be doing a modelers event. Um, we, you know, it's in gestation at the moment. So we'll do something online about that. We've got some lovely ideas and we've, that's coming together. We'll be doing things with other people as well. So we've got people we're inviting into us to actually filming, but also we're helping others. So the people who put together that uh, Battle of Berlin uh, series of programs, we're just doing one, um, looking at one with them, which is going to be on Rhine Man 45, about the crossing of the Rhine, the use of armor, use of uh, you know the airborne forces, etc. So we'll be doing some filming with them. So we'll keep you informed about some of these. Not all of them are to do with Patreon. Not all of them are you're gonna have to pay for or anything but you know keep try and keep in the loop and don't give up on uh, on watching our content and uh, on that score as well just finishing off there thank you I would repeat again I don't know whether oh he's down there hello so um, thank you from myself and uh, what was the last line the guy wanted me to say sorry there was a good guy he wanted me to do the uh, here we go he wanted me to say um, the video, Thomas Ogle, there we go, he says he wants to meet to end with the two Ronnie's gag, so it's good night from me and it's good night from Finn, the job, the dog. Um, but um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for those questions. Thank you for the nice comments. Thank you for sharing. You know, one of the other things that's been really interesting, hasn't it, is where people are being able to answer and uh, enthuse other people or answer other people's issues, which are, I think is the better side of looking at the internet. Um, you know, what a sophisticated bunch of people you all are, obviously, because we get very few stupid comments coming out that way, um, apart from poor old Bill from Iowa, apart from poor old Bill from Iowa. Um, but, you know, on the whole, I, I hope you've enjoyed all this. And please, you know, obviously it's not the end of the world. We'll be carrying these on on Patreon and we've got all our other content coming out that way. So from myself and from Finn, thanks very much. All right, Matt, come here then. Come here. Come here. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel. And, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organization, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.